My name is Rachel Sinaway. I am 26 years old and my mom has severe bipolar disorder. She'd always say, life is a party. But at the same time, I'd find her crying in her bed all day. She self-harmed and I would hide the knives that she used when I was eight years old. I'm like in Waston, I'm only 21. Being the youngest, you get spoiled, you know? And I didn't understand why my siblings were so, you know, weird around my mom or why they felt like she was controlling them. She'd tell me, I wanna die, I'm gonna not live till tomorrow. I would sit there as a young kid, just like, oh my gosh, I gotta fix this. All my siblings left, and then boom, my mom had laser focus on me. She got worse and worse controlling my life and basically making it so I had no say in any decision. One day, I changed my schedule. And that's when she decided to take all the pills and uh, basically end her life. I just remember crying and crying and crying and just thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do now? I should have loved her harder. I should have done something to fix this. I feel like, wow, like this really is my fault. If I didn't do this, she wouldn't be here and she would not have tried to commit suicide. She didn't want to leave me and my family. She just wanted to leave the pain she was in. It's been six and a half years. Thankfully, Sonia survived, and she's going to join us later in the show. Right now, though, we have her children. Rachel and Lincoln are with us. Um, <clears throat> welcome to the show. I know how difficult this is. I know how much it took to bring the two of you on this show. So first of all, thank you so much um, for all of this. And I know your intention is to help other people, and that's why you're here. Rachel, you talked about hiding those knives. At the time, you were eight years old. Did you yeah. understand what was happening? Because I, I think about you know, the average eight-year-old, how, how do they even process, I'm moving these knives because mommy wants to hurt herself. How, how do you explain it? I, I knew something about the knives and my mom was not good. I, I almost felt like it was a mystery. Like whenever she was doing bad, the knives would just appear by her bedside, by the computer desk. And I never saw her self-harm, but I knew I had to hide them. Cause I, I, like as a kid, your parents tell you, you know, don't use that knife. It's too sharp. But in my case, I was telling my mom that like, you shouldn't have these knives. They're too sharp. But whenever I got to be around 10 years old or 12, I saw her self-harm. She was in a closet crying and I had been coloring, and so I brought my marker with me to go find her, and when I found her, there was blood, and I remember, I don't know how I kept my composure, but I just looked at her and said, let's trade. So I took the knife, and she took the marker, and she used the marker to, you know, go wherever she would have wanted to self-harm. So you, at 10 years old, had the presence of mind to say to your mom, let's trade, giving her the crayon, and you took the knife? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I I don't know if it's because I was the oldest, um, but I did feel this strong sense that I had to protect her. And that's why even at eight, when I was hiding the knives before going to school, I remember frantically running around the house trying to find them all before the bus came or before my ride came. And I just felt like she isn't capable of taking care of herself. I don't know why, but she isn't. And so I need to do that while my dad's gone. Your dad was in the home. Your parents are still married. He was working at a hospital. And a lot of this, you all were present while he was away working. Lincoln, you were the baby of the family, as you pointed yeah. out. Um, I was listening to Rachel and, and both of you in your video diaries. The idea that, you know, mom is struggling so much so she can't get out of bed. You know, she can't, if there's a PTA or a parent meeting, she can't get out of bed. If you want a bowl of oatmeal, she can't get out of bed. How did you understand it? Did you turn to your older siblings to get them to explain it? How I understood it more was just that um, my siblings were more struggling with my mom than I was because being the youngest and being so young when she was diagnosed, I didn't really understand what mental illness was or what she was going through. And so it was more of a factor of like Rachel would help me out or Rachel would make me food and, you know, Alex would help me out too. So I never really noticed it was not normal for your mom to always stay in bed because growing up that young, you just think, oh, that's the norm, right? A mom's supposed to stay in bed that long. But for Rachel, she knew a lot more than I did. At age 15, 
it became real for you. You started to understand. Um, you and your mom had an argument, and your mother locked herself in a room and tried to take her life. She swallowed 200 pills and ended up in a coma. Um, the first thing you felt was what when that happened? So, sorry, and that's kind of, <laughs> I answer the best I can. So what I first felt was confusion because everything happened so fast. I didn't understand what was going on until my dad called me, explained she was in the hospital, self-induced coma, what that means. And then I felt anger at first, and then I felt anger and guilt. Like, if I didn't just um, try to change that one thing on my schedule, this would never happen. Thank you so much for joining us. Hearing your children uh, relive a lot of this in hopes of helping other children and other moms like you. How does that feel? It feels like that we're making something that is extremely painful in our family, hopefully to get people talking and seeing where we are today, that there's hope that at that time, you know, I felt my life was worthless and I attempted suicide in hopes that my life would end. And seeing um, the type of trauma that it caused my children, especially Lincoln, um, to this day, it's, it's still a hard thing to take. You know, it's one of those knee-jerk things that people will say. I don't think they say it to hurt you, but I do think they wonder, as parents, you know, live for your children, that there's supposed to be enough love there for them that gets you through. But we know that's not the case. You can love your children from the top of their heads to the bottom of their toes, but you are dealing with an illness that consumes. Yeah. You know, I often tell people, I love my children. I would take a bullet for my children. I think people who have died from suicide or having suicidal feelings, it's not that they want to leave their loved ones, their friends. It's like the pain becomes so great. It silences everything. You don't see the love of your children, your family, your friends, you can't feel or see anything. And the pain becomes so all-consuming that it just silences everything. And that is all that's there. We're talking about the fact that your own father had taken his life, suffered um, years with bipolar disorder. And your fear was that this would happen, this diagnosis would, would reach one of your children. And as it is, Lincoln, you have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder. When you received that diagnosis, what was that like for you knowing you're the third generation now? It was hard because for a long time they told me, oh, you just have depression. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, I probably have bipolar. Like there's no way having a bipolar mother and our hair is just, just bipolar. It's not gonna happen to me. So when I finally got the okay, I'm like, yeah, you have bipolar. I was confused and I was sad, but also like, trying to make the best out of the situation because I'm like, oh, maybe I'll be like my mom's dad who, even though he committed suicide, he was super like happy and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see the behind the scenes of his life. I just saw, you know, him raising me as a grandkid being super fun. And then I really didn't want to be like my mom for a long time. I was like, I'm not going to be like my mom. I'm going to be the opposite of her. And thankfully, by the time she got better is when I got diagnosed and therapy and love and forgiveness really got me through it. I, I mean, the, you know, I was listening to your words and just trying to figure out like, how does he feel? And I was going to ask you, are you afraid? But I have the answer in your eyes. You're, you don't seem, you seem to be prepared and not afraid. Yeah. I think, again, like seeing my mom go basically rock bottom to sky high, I always thought, you know, if you have a mental illness, it always gets so much worse over time that you can't even do life. But with her, she's doing life after hitting rock bottom. So I'm like, maybe I can always do life. And now the skills she has, so maybe I will never hit rock bottom. So that's why it gives me hope. Tanya, how does that feel to know your struggles and your openness? Because I should point out, you and Rachel have this incredible book that um, touches on so many things. It's the inspiring true story of a woman's struggle from within, an impossible life that you and Rachel have written together. Having your son be so brave and embrace his journey um, I know you have to be proud. I'm proud of him, and he's not my kid. <laughs> yes, 
that is where I feel like um, our family, mental illness wasn't really talked about for a long time. And now it's becoming more of a topic, which is so important. And I think what people need to know who have the mental illness or family that has the mental illness that's affected by mental illness, that there is professional care out there. There yeah. are skills, there's medicine, there's hope. And that mental illness doesn't have to be a life sentence. 